Hi, my name is Llewellyn Griffith Swain. I'm a SRE manager here at Vodafone UK and I look after the release, resiliency and performance engineering teams. Within Vodafone Digital or Digital Engineering UK, um, we look after anything that you access through the internet. So whether that be the My Vodafone app, chatbots or any of the websites. And finally, I'm here today to talk to you about observability's code and how we achieve this with Terraform. So before we get started, I wanted to talk a little bit about the road to observability as code or OAC as we call it. So Vodafone itself, we're on a journey from being a traditional telco into a techco. So that's a technology communications company with a big emphasis on software engineering. In 2018, we started our DevOps journey. So this was a lot of insourcing and we rapidly grew in scale and size as we were able to deliver and meet the demands of the business. In 2019, our SRE journey started. We were fortunate enough that this came organically as we'd reached a point where in order to accelerate the rate as to which we could deliver, we needed to have SRE in place due to the scale as to which we were working at. I was fortunate enough to be one of the first four SREs that we had. So a lot of the stuff that we're gonna be talking about today, I helped build the initial implementations, but the team has taken it one step further. In 2020, uh, it's also worth noting that we went live with our full infrastructure as code zero touch environments. So this is where everything is done through a CI/CD pipeline. This is where kind of the need for observability as code came from, because if we're treating all of our environments and applications as code, we need to treat our observability the exact same. Through these three things, we believe that we'd have a very good vehicle for software delivery. And today I'm gonna to talk about how we monitor that. So I wanted to start off by talking about the challenge that we have. Um, so as I said, in 2018, when we started, we, had, we started insourcing and getting quite a lot of developers. We had a centralized monitoring team that were looking after monitors, dashboards, and alerting. Um, and this was fine to start with, but as we grew and we added more and more developers, this team then became a bottleneck because we would have to wait for the monitoring and alerting to be provisioned before our projects could go live. To add further challenge to this, um, as we were on the DevOps journey and about encouraging uh, the ownership of the developer's code end to end, we had a separate production team that would take those um, alerts. So we needed a way for monitoring and alerting to be implemented and help to try and increase our efficiency. So when we started, the actual challenge that we had was we had about 150 plus developers. We have a lot more now, um, but to start with, we had about 150. We needed the solution to encourage ownership so that they could truly own their code end to end. And as a part of this though, we also needed to be able to give an insight into production status at any moment in time. Finally, being an SRE team, the solution needed to follow SRE principles. So as I mentioned before, we had a very small team to implement this. By following SRE principles, the solution needed to be automated. We needed to enable the developers to have ownership end to end and, it's a, and remove that bottleneck, which meant that it had to be self-service. The solution needs to be simple, enable the devs to have control and also be repeatable and written as code. Finally, I wanted to talk about the tools that we did and we started using. So to start with, we had Azure DevOps as our CI CD. All of our repositories, releases, teams, users um, were all stored in Azure DevOps. We just started using PagerDuty. Um, so at the time, it was a lot of kind of manual configuration, but we'd only really just started the SRE team and only just started using the tool. The same can be said for our monitoring tool, which was Datadog. Um, so when we had the challenge and we looked at the tool sets as to which we have, we were very fortunate that both of them um, had a Terraform provider that we could then use and implement. And finally, just to know all of our actual infrastructure and applications were running on AWS. So all of these things combined gave us a very good starting point. Next, I wanted to go on the initial solution. So we wanted to start small. Um, it's all about kind of making the small, small changes as quickly as possible. So to start with, we wanted to do synthetic API tests. Now, these were our first choice because they were the easiest to do, because essentially all we needed was the endpoint URL in order for us to monitor and understand the response code. So we just had to build the monitors. Um, once we did this, we then moved forward and accelerated into building a 50,000 foot view of production. Um, so this is essentially our, as traffic's coming in, anything through our CDN, through the front end, the back end layers, and also into any of the con other content stuff that we had in the background. Um, so that was great because what it would mean is that if there was any issue at any moment in time, we could take a look in one place and identify exactly where the challenge was. Now, having a 50,000 foot view is great, but we also needed to understand specifically what was going on with that service. For this and for the 50,000 foot view, we followed the red, um, the red way of monitoring services, which is rate, error, and duration, or latency. So essentially, we're looking at the amount of requests coming in, what's the error count, and what's the duration that's being faced. 
And the idea is by having these three things, you have a pretty good indication of how your service is performing. Now, so we had the service specific dashboards, but we also needed to have monitors because at the end of the day, we don't want people to sit there watching screens to see what's changed on the dashboard. We need it to actively call them out. And as a part of creating those monitors, we also needed to place all the development teams on call so that if there was an issue, they wouldn't have to look at a screen, they would get paid straight away and be ready and available in order to fix the issue. So throughout that journey, uh, we went away and we built that. Um, and we had a few lessons along the way. Um, so the first one that I wanted to talk about was building modular with variable blocks. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see that I've got some code here. We were using Terraform 0.11 at this point in time. So if you see count.index, that's why. Um, but nevertheless, it's still a very good example. So you can see here that we have a synthetic test that's being created and we have a variable that's called endpoints. Essentially, this is just the monitor to see, is this website up? So is Vodafone.co.uk, Vodafone trade-in or register your interest, are they up and available? So with that, we've also got name. So here we've got the three names of what those synthetics were. Now, because these weren't produced in variable blocks, although we had a module resource to call, um, it actually became a nightmare to manage because although this is just two variables that you've got here, there's over 10 in the example on the left-hand side, which meant that we were in the position of managing multiple lists of variables, which actually was, was an absolute nightmare. Um, and the way out of this was to build modular with variable blocks. So that same code that you just saw and I've just changed to, this is the same thing, but looking at it in a variable block. Now, it's not as pretty to look at, but the variables then actually turned into these blocks, um, which make it much more human readable and much more easier to manage. Uh, the next lesson that we have was uh, we had was don't fall behind on version upgrades. So again, we're using Terraform 0.11. It's a very good example, but we use the same example. So here on the left-hand side, we have a module or a resource um, in order to build a synthetic API test in Datadog. So as you can see, and the way that count.index used to work with Terraform 11 was that we would assign a count. So we'd look into a variable and count how many times it appeared. So in this case, we're looking at the variable endpoints and we're counting to see, okay, I need to provision three synthetics or three monitors, let's say. So uh, monitor one would be Vodafone.co.uk, monitor two would be trade-in, monitor three would be register your interest. I would then have a name that would then be associated with each of those, which you can see here. And it's the same thing. So Vodafone UK would be called homepage, trade in would be called trade in, and the URL register your interest would be would be register your interest. Now the challenge that we had um, was that essentially this is great as it works, but the challenge is when you want to change anything, um, that's when the difficulty came. So the way that Terraform used to associate where a URL would appear in its index or where a monitor would appear in the state, um, it would assign a numeric value, and these values didn't change. So for instance, if we decided that we no longer wanted to do trade-in or the URL changed, um, but we didn't replace exactly where that URL sat, what would happen is that Terraform would run, it would say, okay, I need to delete this monitor, which is the trade-in one, or delete this URL, and replace it with the next one, which is register your interest. So what that meant was that all of the history that I have on that synthetic monitor is actually looking at something else. Um, so essentially it meant that we could no longer trust what it was that we were doing. Now, this was actually quite a big um, cause of, of toil for us um, before Terraform 12 came out. Now, traditionally, I would have said as the old operations for me, we want to be on the most mature, stable, tested version. Um, but actually by upgrading to 0.12, we were able to use for each loops, which gets away with the challenge that we had about um, numerical indexes being assigned. And instead there's a dictionary value. So the name of the synthetic, which meant that the issue that we had would never happen again. So those are some of the key kind of two lessons that we had. Um, and so the initial solution that we had uh, was enabling kind of total visibility. And this is how we did it. So we had Terraform um, that was essentially calling a Python script. That Python script would go into Azure DevOps. I mentioned earlier, we had our CI, CD, but all of our teams, users, and the services that they owned also stored in there. So that would make an API call to Azure DevOps and pull out all of that information. Next, the Python script would also go to AWS and, run, and pull all of our running ECS tasks. So then we had an indication of what was it that was running in that given environment. Next, all of that data would be input into Terraform and it would use the data from Azure DevOps with the teams, users and services to provision teams, users and escalation policies uh, within PagerDuty. So straight away, it gave us a vehicle to put all of our developers on call, but in a completely automated fashion with nothing being manually done. Now, 
taking all the information that we had from AWS and ECS, um, we then fed that into Datadog through Terraform and it enabled us to provision monitors, dashboards, um, and eventually things like, as we saw, synthetics, APM, etc. cetera. Um, now this was great. Uh, originally when we achieved this, um, we needed to train the developers um, to be able to be on call and make sure that they were comfortable with everything that we'd built. Um, it was actually a, a kind of a blessing in disguise that we did that because it meant that we had to sit with the solution, uh, cooling us out for a couple of weeks. And essentially what we found out was that our state file had become huge. We were provisioning over 150 developers, 100 services, monitors, dashboards, different kinds of kind of performance metrics that we were doing. And essentially what it meant was that our state was huge and it would take us 17 minutes to run Terraform. Now, that wasn't really ideal because it could significantly delay the rate as to which we could deliver. So it ties in quite nicely to lesson three, um, which is to split your state. So essentially what we did was we split our state file into the pager duty users, into the dashboards, into the API tests, into the monitors. Um, and through this, it meant that Terraform could run uh, much, much faster um, and would also increase the rate as to which we could deliver and wouldn't be a bottleneck. Now, that was how we kind of provisioned total visibility across our entire estate. Um, however, that was just calling us out. So the way that we went forward with this is how did we share it with everyone? Well, essentially the way it worked is that we had us as the SRE team. We were developing Terraform modules for PagerDuty and Datadog. And the idea is, is we would run Terraform, obviously it would provision those services. But the real beauty was that the developers could call those services. So you can see on the right hand side, there's just a little snippet there, but essentially all we're doing there is creating a synthetic, we're creating a duration monitor, and we're also creating a page of duty schedule. Um, all through code and everything that you see being declared is just the variables because the modules are already built and all they're doing is pulling down those modules from, from our S3 bucket, running Terraform and it's inputting those variables. Originally, when they started, the idea and the vehicle to deliver new enhancements and requests or features was that they would come to us directly as the SRE team. But what happened next surprised all of us, um, but was absolutely something that was welcome. Um, what we saw was that if there was areas that we hadn't delivered something or they were using like a new technology or a new language, um, what we had was developers then started submitting PRs to us. So they would submit PRs to build the modules. We would work with them, approve it, put it in that S3 bucket, and then straight away, any other developer can call it. So not only are we making it self-service, we're also making it so that they can easily input and build into that. So that was the original solution that we built. Um, that was, you know, it was absolutely great and kind of game-changing for us. It really removed the, the bottleneck and challenge and essentially enabled the developers to develop as fast as they wanted to go. Now, we kind of, we, we, we managed to hit what we wanted to do. We achieved our objective, but we didn't really stop there. Um, so how we've kind of continued onto that. So I said, we, were, we wanted to API assess 50,000 put view, red dashboards and placing development teams on call. It had to be self-service, it had to be automated, um, all of that as to which we achieved. So what we've then done and continued on with it is synthetic browser tests. So this is now being able to programmatically uh, create bots that conduct customer user journeys throughout the website. This then helps us because what we can do is have that as a release blocker, which will essentially mean that you must have a passing synthetic in order for you to deploy to the next environment. Um, this actually became very, very valuable when we started doing destroy and deploy environments. So if you wanted a new performance environment, you could spin it up. But the way we would validate the health is we would run every customer journey. And this, having it through Terraform, meant that we could run it straight away without having to program anything manually. Finally, through implementing kind of Datadog and collecting as much metrics as we possibly could, we also had the capability to then generate SLOs off of everything that we did. Um, but even better, taking that one step further, we were then able to automatically create those SLOs through Terraform again. But it came to the point where we are actually now running Terraform at every release and every single development team has their own state stored in S3. Um, so for us, this has been absolutely game changing and it's really enabled us to start treating all environments the same. Finally, as far as what's the benefit of everything that we've been doing. Um, so from a business perspective, uh, what we've actually found is that we ha now have a time to production of less than four hours. This is, signif this is significantly reducing with every week or month that goes past. Uh, but last time we took this cut, it was four hours was our time to production. 
We have the best ever digital availability of 99.9% .9 and that's due to the level of insight that we've had but also the capability of being able to ensure that the right people are looking at the incident in the shortest space of time. This is then reflected by our MTTA or mean time to acknowledge an incident. So when an issue happens, a call goes out to a developer, how quickly do we acknowledge that? That is currently on average less than a minute. Then we have MTTR, so our mean time to repair. So this is essentially when we have an issue, when do we know that the incident has been over finished and service is restored? This is now an average of 30 minutes. We didn't have these metrics before, but hopefully you can appreciate these are something that for ourselves we're very proud of. Um, feel is has a significant benefit to not only a developer's business, but also our customers. Now, from a business perspective, that's great, but what about the developers? So for the developers, we've enabled them to have self-serve monitoring and alerting. They can develop whatever they want, whenever they want, in a safe manner, um, which will mean that essentially, even if uh, monitoring and alerting was forgotten about, it would be automatically applied because we're running Terraform at every single deployment. Developers have full ownership of their code, um, and also they have automated insights through the software delivery lifecycle. Um, what does this mean? Well, essentially, let's say we hit an issue in a dev environment. Um, if they wanna then make sure that they can capture that, if it happens ever again, they could build a monitor. But that monitor wouldn't just have to be in the dev environment, they could also run that for the performance environment, sit environments, and also production. So straight away, they've had an issue, they've hit it, but they can also more or less be made aware of it if it happens in anywhere else throughout the development lifecycle. Finally, what about SREs? So the benefit to our SREs or to the teams is that using Terraform has enabled us to standardize across our environments. So this can be seen more recently. Um, so I just started looking after our performance testing. Um, and as a part of that, we needed to put the same monitoring alerting that we had in production into our performance environment. That took 17 minutes. Um, and all that was was just running of Terraform um, across all of the different services in order to implement that. Next, with SREs, we've also got automated SLOs. So SRE is all about SLOs and SLIs, but now we've got them automated. So even if we have a new service going in, we can automatically see the SLI and also then configure and work with the product owners to make those SLOs. Finally, there's a big toil reduction. So this is the time that we spend doing repetitive tasks. And by having monitoring and alerting defined as code, means that once we've done it, we never have to do it again. So through all of this, we now have all of our infrastructure defined as code, all of our applications defined as code, and all of our observability or monitoring defined as code. And through this, I hope you can see there's been a significant benefit. Thank you ever so much for your time.